Good evening. Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Facebook Live session. My name is Sam Tchaikovsky, and I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager here at the JCN. Uh, so I'm just going to run through a couple of bits of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, tonight's session is titled Pressure Ulcers versus IAD, Avoiding the Confusion. Uh, and this is a special event brought to you on uh, Stop the Pressure Day 2021. Uh, so tonight's speaker is Siobhan McCullough, and uh, Siobhan is the Lead Tissue Viability Clinical Nurse Specialist at University Hospitals Plymouth NHS Trust. Um, and today's session is brought to you by Medicare Plus. So um, throughout the session, you can leave all your comments in the comments section. Please do ask any questions that you might have for Siobhan, uh, and I'll ask them in the live Q&A at the end. Uh, certificates will also be available to download at the end of the session. So keep an eye out for all of the links for those and any links from our sponsor Medicare Plus as well. Uh, slides will also be available on our website in the next 24 hours. Uh, finally, you will notice that we are recording the, uh, the today's session remotely. So if there are any technical issues, please do bear with us, but we'll, uh, we'll be on the case and uh, our team will be in the comments section, making sure you're all kept up to date. So that's all from me. I will see you in the live Q&A at the end, and I will now pass you over to Siobhan. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session on pressure ulcers versus incontinence associated dermatitis. Um, thank you to the Journal of Community Nursing for inviting me to speak today. And happy Stop the Pressure Day. Um, I hope you've all had a great day celebrating the amazing work that you do to stop pressure ulcers and raising awareness. It really is a celebration day about all the hard work that we do. Um, and I'm very pleased to be talking on Stop the Pressure Day on this subject, which is a, um, a subject very close to my heart. So hopefully today's session will help um, identify the differences between incontinence associated dermatitis, otherwise known as IAD, which is caused by moisture associated skin damage or MASD and pressure ulcers um, and in understanding how to report and um, look after those accordingly. We're going to outline how IAD may occur as a result of MASD and we're going to outline the importance of assessment and classification of IAD and understanding what a pressure ulcer is. I'm also going to introduce you to the Skin Moisture Alert reporting tool or the SMART resource tool, which I'll come on to. So what is MASD? Well, it's helpful to know the causes of MSD um, on a skin function barrier aspect. So MASD is, is caused by prolonged exposure to various sources of moisture, which can include urine, feces, perspiration, wound exudate, mucus saliva and their contents. Uh, MASD can cause an inflammation of the skin, which can range from a mild to a severe MASD, where you may find erosion of the cutaneous layer of the skin. So it's helpful for us to know how this happens. So on our skin, we've got what we, we call an acid mantle, and it really is a barrier, um, acts as a barrier function for our skin. And this is created by a mixture of secretions from the sebaceous glands on the surface of the skin. And it contributes to keeping our skin at a slightly acidic pH of about 4.5 to 5.5. And so we need this slightly acidic barrier um, because it acts as a barrier to pathogens and bacteria not being able to enter into the epidermal surface layer of our skin. So a really good way to have a visual of that is something we use in training a lot. And it's this kind of building block theory. So our skin is essentially made up of building blocks. And what the acid mantle does is it kind of protects the building blocks. So if you imagine the skin as building blocks like you see in a house, and we know that bricks in a house need cement to hold them together, and they do it very well. But if you take away the surface of that, it's easy for bacteria to get into the cement and break it down. And essentially, you get a shedding of the bricks. The bricks aren't as strong without that cement. So that acid mantle needs to be slightly acidic for it to be functioning in that way. So when we get an excess hydration or um, moisture causing urine or feces um, or just overhydration of the skin, our skin acid mantle becomes slightly more alkaline. So when it does and it reaches this pH balance about 6.5, you can see that acid mantle breaks and bacteriums and pathogens are just free to come in and sit in that cement and break it down. 
And when that happens, our skin bricks essentially become unstable and break down when we may see the epidermis and the surface of the layer start to shed. So it's quite useful for any of you that are working in education or with your patients and carers out in practice to really understand that it's not a case of just popping some barrier protection cream or spray on the skin when you're um, doing personal care for a patient, but actually what it's doing. And it really is about protecting that acid mantle. So we hear the term MASD, or moisture associated skin dermatitis or damage, um, but it's a very much an umbrella term for a lot of associated conditions that cause this excess moisture. Um, and it's helpful for us to know as clinicians and carers, um, well, what one we're looking at um, and what is it that we're looking at? What is the cause of it? Um, and in understanding that, it helps us approach our care planning, essentially. So what falls under the umbrella of MASD atypically is these moisture lesions or breakdown as moisture, which is a prolonged exposure to urine and feces. So thinking of our incontinent patients. Um, we can get peristomal dermatitis, that's from affluence from an ostomy. We can get peri-wound dermatitis, which is a prolonged exposure to wound exudate. So I, I imagine any of you that um, are listening or watching that take care of leg ulcers, wounds, we know that, that those wounds can kick out a lot of exudate. That can have the same overhydration of the skin effect of breaking down that skin barrier and make it vulnerable to further breakdown and non-wound healing. So it's very much part of our wound healing acronym under time to make sure that the uh, peri wounds area or the edges are protected. Um, and so wound exudate can kick out a loss of fluid, which can cause this peri wound dermatitis. We can also see interstrigo or ITD, which is prolonged um, exposure to perspiration in skin folds. So what does this look like? So this is a, a typical intertrigo or skin fold um, moisture damage. Um, and you can see here, it's kind of the loss of that barrier, that protective function is taken away and you have erythema and inflammation which started here. So when you get this loss of barrier, um, you get it because of an overhydration of the skin and that disrupts that skin mantle, that barrier properties of the stratum corneum to the very top surface of our skin. And this allows all those bacteriums and pathogens to penetrate the epidermis, the surface layer. And once that skin is overhydrated, it's more prone to physical damage, including frictional shear. So if any of you have been in the bath for too long and you get out and you see your hands are starting to get a bit more crinkled, they're a little bit more susceptible for say skin tearing than they would be if they were not overhydrated. So some of the sources of MASD, these aren't gonna be a shocker to any of you out there, um, is incontinence. It's probably one of the most common uh, uh, ways that we see MS, MASD. Um, and you can see here on the picture on the left, it's um, quite spread out. Um, rather than pressure ulcers being quite punched out over bony prominences, it's quite spread out over both buttocks. We get it from wound exudate, as we said, around the peri wound area here. So the second to the left picture, you can see that kind of whitish maceration around the peri wound um, of overhydration from wound exudate. Again, you've got the skin fold moving along to the next picture, um, where you can see it's um, again getting quite inflamed. And that's again where the skin uh, folds are together for too long and you get excess perspiration. And something we see a lot in our colorectal units is around the stoma output. Um, and you can also see this around PEG sites and also tracheocytes. You can also see it around um, people that have excess mucus and saliva. So in some groups that can also cause around the face um, MASD. So these are probably the most typical sources of moisture skin damage that we see in practice. So the signs of MASD are erythema, um, excoriation, you can get maceration, so the, the bottom left picture here with that heel, that's a hugely macerated heel. Um, quite often they can be itchy, and as a result, patients or residents will scratch their skin. So sometimes you might see scratch marks over there as well. You can sometimes get sources of secondary infection or fungal infections, and um, from the fluid just sitting there and breaking down, it can pose a risk for extra infection. Once you've lost that, um, that acid mantle, um, it's kind of free for all for any pathogens or bacteria that are sitting on flora that's sitting on the skin can then enter and, and cause problems. 
And as a result, you can get a lot of increased pain with MASD. So as we know, our nerve endings, this is my nerve ending that's floating just underneath the surface of the skin. And um, so as we lose the surface of our skin and those nerve endings are exposed, quite often our patients will say it's burning, it's sore. If they've got capacity and they're able to verbalize, they'll usually tell you that something's not right, that something's hurting. So pain is definitely an indicator that there is an MASD there. Right, so what is IAD? So incontinence associated dermatitis. Under that umbrella, let's look at IAD now. So IAD is an inflammatory skin condition and it occurs again when the skin is exposed to urine or feces. And again, it can lead to secondary infection. So pain um, or skin breakdown, skin lesions. So the most typical areas that are affected, again, won't be a shocker wherever you have urine and feces um, are gonna be the perineum, the labial folds, the groins, the buttocks and the upper thighs. And again, I'm sure any of you that have nursed anybody with an MASD, that picture on the right, you know how painful that is. Um, that patient won't want to sit on that bottom. They probably won't have that much of an appetite. And there is an increased risk of pressure damage, um, both because of the skin loss at the surface of the skin, but also having to lie from side to side off the affected area. So the clinical characteristics of IAD is quite widespread um, and quite blotchy. Whereas pressure ulcers tend to be over a bony prominence like a sacrum or greater trochanter um, or heel, um, it, it's quite blotchy, so it's quite spread out. So that's one indicator. You can get pressure damage, which is spread out, but where it's like this picture on the top left, you'll see it's quite superficial skin loss all over the place. Um, so ask if they're incontinent um, and have a look and see if the skin is overhydrated. And that can be a clinical indicator that it is IAD. So there's quite indistinct margins. And as I said, macerations. And you get these patches of partial thickness skin erosion. Um, in, in the case of skin folds, the damage can be quite linear within the fold, so in between the thighs, underneath breasts, underneath arms. Um, I've seen somebody with a, quite a severe contracture to the neck where it was happening actually underneath the neck and it was actually getting quite severe. Um, so anywhere where there's a skin fold, it's a case of when we're assisting with personal care that we're monitoring that. So you'll get leakage of serous exudates, um, sometimes bleeding. Um, it may be over a bony prominence, um, it might be on skin folds, and again that anal cleft, particularly where your buttocks are kind of squished together as it were, it's a real danger factor there. So we get perianal irritation and you get these kinds of irregular shaped edges as you can see in the pictures here. As I said, there's your nerve endings so right underneath the surface. If any of you have got a burn or a graze, and it really hurts, right? You're like this. But have you ever got a deep paper cut and you're there showing your colleagues at work and going, oh, look how deep that is. But it's a different pain. You've kind of gone straight through the nerve ending. So it's sore, but it's a different kind of pain. So a lot of our patients describe it as a burning type pain. Um, and so being that MASD is a lot of highly preventable, it's a real issue for us if they're in a lot of pain, they're not going to want to eat, they're not going to want to sit on it, and in some cases they require extra analgesia, which causes extra issues. So who's at risk? All patients and residents with incontinence are at risk. Anybody with excess moisture in the affected area is at risk. What their research has found is that patients with double incontinence are the most vulnerable. So with urinary incontinence and loose stools, it's kind of, if you're not taking care of that skin area, it's kind of a ticking time bomb that that skin is gonna to become too alkaline and you're gonna start losing that skin acid mantle. So actually this was given to me when I was asked to do this training session and I didn't know it was this high. I knew it was high, but not this high. Um, so what we've got some of the, from the, some of the research is that actually 41% of nursing home residents have IAD. So if you're a, um, a nurse or a carer at a nursing home or residential home now, if you think of some of your residents, how many have got continence products and how many have got um, mild to moderate to severe MASD? So 43% of all incontinent patients in acute care have IAD, 
So I'm an acute care organisation and we do have more MASD reported than pressure ulcers, which I know for a lot of my acute care colleagues is the same picture there as well. But it's kind of like pressure ulcers gets all the press, right? But MASD is equally important. So here's the science, guys. This is a really good um, slide just to remind us of the breakdown barrier that you can use in your training as a kind of simplifying way of, of, of teaching, I guess. And I always use that brick um, analogy because for me that just makes sense as a visual prompt. But here's the stages of what happens. So we've got water from urine and feces, and this is pulled in and held in the skin. And this leads to an overhydration an inflammation and swelling and a disruption to skin structure. So the skin at this point, the appearance can change and it can feel slightly wet, slightly boggy. And in some cases it starts having that kind of pruned look. So like when you get out of the bath and you look at your fingertips where it's getting slightly pruned. So it's then that more, it's more prone to irritants such as urine and feces as well as injury from friction and rubbing. So as I say, when your skin, uh, stratum corneum is now getting very boggy and wet um, and you get rubbing, it's only a, a matter of time before that skin surface is actually removed. So this can happen when you come into contact with clothing, incontinence pads or in bed linen. And especially if you've got a resident with uh, who's bum shuffling and we all know the residents and patients with bum shuffle and we tried to get them not to do it but they will still do it and as a result if they are um, incontinent with pads and they're bum shuffling a bit against advice um, we know that that can cause superficial skin loss. So what happens next is that the pH of the skin changes. So as I said earlier, it's night, uh, normally slightly acidic, 4.4 to 5.5, which keeps it nice and healthy and prevents the infection of uh, invasion of harmful bacteria. When it becomes more alkaline, this is breaking down that acid mantle and it becomes more alkaline, allowing more of those harmful bacteria to invade and this increases the risk of infection. So essentially, wet skin is a really good environment for bacteria and germs to enter in and increases the potential risk of fungal and urinary tract um, infections as well, especially around um, if it's um, in the groin areas and labial areas, increasing your risk of UTIs. So with liquid feces, it causes more damage than solid feces. It, it's wetter and the enzymes are more destructive in the liquid form. Um, so we see it a lot in our colorectal wards where there's fistulas and stomas and it can be a real challenge to try and protect um, the peristoma area. Um, and we work quite closely with our stoma nurses in um, with our wards, really trying to educate about the importance of barrier and protecting that skin. So the enzymes in the feces can exasperate the effects of the urine on the skin. Um, so if you're in an acute organisation, you might want to look at your bowel management systems um, with your medical teams. And if you're in the community, you might want to refer to your continent service for advice um, or more absorbent pads or more regular pads. I know it's difficult to get extra pads out there, guys, but you can always ask for advice. So essentially, incontinence um, of urine and feces is more damaging to the skin than either type of incontinence on its own. So we've talked about hydration, overhydration, and the risk of the pH balance becoming alkaline and that causing the breakdown of the skin mantle. Well, it is a difficult balance to get guys because actually if it's too dry, it's also susceptible to infection and alteration. So it really is about that, those bricks and creating them just the right amount of hydration. So dry skin is more susceptible. If you think of your patients with very dry skin, if you think of your patients with diabetic feet with those fissures, so those cracks in their heels, we know that we need to rehydrate those areas to get that natural skin barrier back and um, reduce the erythema, reduce the roughness of the skin and soften any of those skin cracks. And this also eases itching. So any of you that have got out the shower, you forgot to put on your favorite lotion or potion before you went to work, you're in the car going to work, you get to work and you think, oh, my skin feels a bit dry, a bit itchy. Most of our patients and residents will be the same. A lot of them will tell us, you need to put some um, cream on my leg nurse. You know, we do hear that a lot and it's a great reminder, but a lot, some of our patients don't have capacity. So, you know, that skincare hydration, it's not really just a case of putting a lotion and potion on. It really is about protecting that skin uh, barrier. 
So dry skin can be um, an issue as well. So as we say, what do we do? We put emollients on, uh, and emollient will increase the amount of water that we can hold into the skin. And emollients really should be considered as part of that skincare regime to ensure that skin is hydrated and supple. Um, so do make it part of your personal care planning, um, um, as well as your pressure loss prevention planning, that it's actually written up that people know that this is, you know, Mrs. Smith's favourite emollient, and this is what we need to put on when we do personal care, or after a shower or bath, um, or prompt the patient to put it on themselves if they're able to. Um, so just be careful with very, very wet bottoms and skin with hydration and emollients. Um, we tend not to overuse them on the buttock areas, on the intimate areas with incontinence and feces because you don't want to add extra hydration where it's already hydrated. Um, so the go-to um, for us is the pH um, balancing foam and cleanser. So you can get continence cleansers out there, which... Um, clean the surface of the skin, but they also maintain that pH balance. So look out there for any foam or cleansers that you may want to try for your moderate to severe um, MASD. So where there's um, superficial skin loss and it's very, very painful. So we've looked at MASD, we are going to bring them together, but let's remind ourselves what a pressure ulcer is. It is not the pressure day, we're going to have to talk about pressure ulcers. So I'm sure a lot of you know by now what a pressure ulcer is, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. Um, but as a reminder, it's um, localised injury to the skin and underlying uh, tissues, usually over a bony prominence. And so the four main factors in causing pressure ulcers are shocker, newsflash, pressure, um, but also shear and friction and moisture. And sometimes all of those things. So you can get pressure and shear related injuries that result in something like a SDCI, suspected deep tissue injury. Um, so that is the main factors uh, that cause our pressure ulcers. They can affect anyone at any point in their life. So it's not just healthcare, the elderly, we see them, we see them in maternity, we see them in our neonatals, our paediatrics, um, as our maternity patients where they've had epidurals and they might be in the uh, bed longer, any of us really are at risk. The difference is, is that if any of you now are sitting on a hard chair, in about 20 minutes, you're gonna move. And that's because you get a little message saying, okay, you need to reperfuse around your pelvis. And you say, no problem at all pelvis, I will reperfuse for you and you'll move. Uh, we see it in training all the time, we can't help ourselves. But a lot of the residents um, that we look after and the patients we look after don't get that signal, hence our repositioning. They cause a lot of pain um, and a lot of uh, longer stays in hospital with increased risk of infection and cost. And again, I was a bit shocked by the stat that came out from um, Julian Guest, who's done uh, loads of work on wound care and the burden of wound care and the costs of wound care. And this was from NHS Improvement in 2018 that found that pressure ulcers alone cost the NHS 1.4 million per day. So wound care in general is the third biggest expenditure in the NHS behind cancer care and diabetes, about 5.4 billion a year, but pressure ulcers is 1.4 million a day. So there is a real uh, case for us to be able to spread the word of what we're teaching now for you to, to be able to go back to your workplaces and teach others, because prevention is definitely better than treatment, not just for our patients, but for the trusts that we work in, the organisations that we work in for their bank balances too. So let's go through briefly the S-Skin. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen this. So the S-Skin is a gold standard acronym for our care planning for pressure ulcers based on all the research and understanding that we have on what prevents a pressure ulcer. It came from America somewhere, I think it was Wisconsin in 2004. It came over to Wales as part of a quality improvement project after that, up to Scotland in 2011, and then NHS England adopted it in 2012. And since then, a lot of NHS trusts and organisations and communities community and now care homes and residential care homes um, and hospices and, and, and lots of people are now implementing it as a care bundle as a care plan prompt um, so in 2012 and NHS England which means next year it's been in England for 10 years which is crazy um, but it is brilliant so do have a look at it if you don't know but essentially it just goes through prompting you what you should be care planning for when you've identified a risk of somebody getting a pressure ulcer so initially we would look at the first S which is the surface so that would be the pressure relieving equipment that they may need, um, including those heel protectors. The next S is skin inspection. So we complete a full skin assessment. 
we complete an individual care plan for that resident or patient. Um, and we need to report our pressure ulcers, guys. That's not just us, it's internationally. We need to benchmark our, our data so we can identify themes of pressure ulcers so that we can then focus our quality improvement plans. So any, any pressure ulcer of two or above um, report. Um, a lot of organisations now should be really one and above, but absolutely, if you're a care home or nursing home, at least grade two or above, we should be reporting. Keep moving is the next um, letter on the acronym. And as we say, you may be moving now, you may be going, oh, okay, I need to refuse a bit. It doesn't take long for pressure damage to start. Um, and we need to be prompting that repositioning to our patients and residents to stop that pressure damage starting and working its way down until it hits bone, grade four pressure ulcer or category four pressure ulcer. So we need to document the frequency of that repositioning. And this does vary on your organization. So for us in the in acute, it may be two hourly. For somewhere else in a nursing home, it may be better four or six hourly. Um, really as regularly as you can. Um, there's a lot of research out there to say the beginning of a pressure ulcer can happen within an hour really. So a grade one, um, but your patients and residents will not want to be turned every hour. They won't be favorable about that. Um, but we do need to regularly reposition. It's definitely an indicator of our care planning. So the next one is I for incontinence. So this is what we're talking about today. Um, moisture damage um, can be a precursor for pressure damage. They can go together and we'll look at some pictures today to explain that. Um, but once you've lost that surface the skin, it can be more of a risk for those, those bricks to continue breaking down. So any pressure as well as moisture damage can accelerate the pressure damage. So as we said, you might consider a referral to the continence team, look at your formulary skin barrier products because these are our go-to to protect that skin mantle and it will help reduce the risk of deterioration. And we recommend absolutely report all of your moisture damage. And the last um, letter in the acronym is N and it's nutrition. And I'm sure most of you know must. If you don't, it's a nutritional uh, screening tool. Um, and we do it because the skin is an organ. It functions like any other organ. It needs adequate nutrition um, to be able to function. So it's really important that we are monitoring our nutritional status of our patients as well. And if they are um, at risk of malnourishment, if there's weight loss or your concerns, we and their must tool is two or above, we should be referring to dietary, uh, dietary advice um, or your dietitian, and you may need to commence your food or fluid balance chart so you can monitor that intake. So let's look at IAD and pressure ulcers. Take a look at my time, make sure I'm not going over. Um, so with IAD, it's a recognised risk factor for pressure ulcers, as we said, but actually they can coexist together. And as you can see with this picture, they're quite easy to misdiagnose with category twos. So I'm sure it's no shocker if I say we get a lot of MASDs and category twos that are mixed up. And sometimes they are separate, but sometimes they're together. And it's very difficult because TVNs, we, we don't always have capacity or time to go and see every MSD or every category two. We kind of get involved at the later stages. So it's really difficult if you're general nursing without TV support to know the difference. So guys, let me just go through some basics for you and hopefully that's some takeaways. So um, with the uh, pressure ulcers and the MSD, they're both uh, superficial skin loss but let's look at the differentiation between them both. So it's important to understand because the prevention and treatment strategies might differ. An air mattress won't stop moisture damage and a barrier application won't stop pressure damage. So we do get misreporting um, of both of those wounds. And as I say, that can affect um, our data that we're collecting and give us a, an unclear picture of actually what is it that we're dealing with clinically. So with IAD, the skin damage that is established as a result of incontinence should not be reported as a pressure ulcer, but should be referred to as MASD to distinguish it. And we need to document those separately, guys, okay? Um, check with your organization in terms of your um, incident reporting, whether they want those reported separately on two different forms or whether you can separate them on one form already. So for those of you using electronic database such as Datex, um, sometimes people report it as a pressure ulcer first, which is what we absolutely need to be reporting pressure ulcers, but you also need to be reporting your MS MSD separately.
So there is guides here um, on differentiating between them. This is a really good uh, guide by Medicare Plus um, between pressure ulcers and IEDs. And I strongly recommend having that pictorial that you can carry around with you. Um, we absolutely need to be reporting our moisture damage. As I said, um, they're quite often higher, higher occurrences than pressure ulcers, but pressure ulcers has got a lot of the press and that's great. But actually, how are we monitoring our MASDs? Are we monitoring them? If we're not, don't panic. Um, the, uh, a revised um, tissue viability consensus document for 2018 is really the document that said, okay, guys, we should be monitoring this now. So it's not that old. So don't worry if you're a residential care home or nursing home, you haven't been regular on monitoring your MSDs, give it a start. Maybe that will be the takeaway. You can go to the next meeting and say, how are we going to monitor these and how are we going to look at the themes and what can we do if our numbers are high? So let's look at some examples of IAD. So this is um, a patient that, guys, the first thing, can you see the sheet, the bed sheet? There's some fluid issue there, isn't there? There's some incontinence, the first thing we saw. Um, and actually this was referred to us for suspected deep tissue injury. And if you can see on each buttock, there's that kind of maroony color, which is looking like there might be suspected um, deep tissue injury. Also the fact that the patient couldn't turn very easily at all. Um, but also because of the excess um, fluids here, we, we needed to treat the offloading. Equally, we needed to protect the skin. Um, so this is where we used our, derma, our Mediderma Rest Barrier Cream, which is for our mild MASD. So mild because the skin is intact, but the risk is high. So we need to protect it, but we don't need huge bells and whistles, complex um, pro creams at this stage, just a, protect, a protecting barrier. Here you can see a severe um, moisture damage. So it's severe because you're losing the surface of the skin and it's starting to slough up to the deeper containers levels of the skin structures. This is a huge risk for infection, for fungal infections, um, for microbial infections. Um, and as a result, we need to step up the treatment plan here. So again, understanding what the cause is, the root cause, and see if we can deal with that. But in terms of skin barrier, um, this is where we would use our more pro um, ointments. So um, you would absolutely, this would be very painful to wash. So you don't want to scrub that bottom in any formal way. Um, so this is where your continence foam and sprays become quite good because you just spray it on and it kind of helps dissolve the urine feces and sweat. Um, and then very gently sweep that away. And then apply your barrier cream for broken skin so for us we would use the mediderma pro foam cleanser incontinence cleanser which is also a ph balancer so again it's about rebuilding that skin mantle and we would then step it up to the mediderma pro cream for extra protection um, but don't slather it on guys i don't know about you but 20 years ago i started as a carer and i remember at the time don't shoot me it was something we did at the time but we used to use soda cream back in the day and unless i had two shiny buttocks looking back at me i didn't think i had done a good enough job as a carer i thought the more we put on the better it, it, you know protected they were but actually as education came along we understood that wasn't what what it, what we need to do use it sparingly so I go still by the three finger rule or the P rule where one P um sorry across three fingers rub both hands together gloved hands and then both buttocks and that is enough so use sparingly you want a thin layer not slathered on so more doesn't mean better so here we've got an example of peri wound um, MASD and you can see that inflammation response of the skin there um, and this wound could be this isn't my patient so I don't know for sure I think Jackie would have to tell you but to me it looks like it could be a dual pressure damage but also MASD so if it is pressure damage over the sacral area working its way down a bit and sloughing up there is also excess fluid around the edges as well so the skin is broken here um, and we don't want to be um, slathering on the initial uh, cream for intact skin so this might be something that you want to use the barrier film for. Um, so the Medizama S barrier film, you can apply around the edges. 
that's me putting it on, sorry. <laughs> um, and that will also stop you over hydrating an area that's already quite wet. So we don't want to put too much cream on, even if it is a barrier cream on skin that's broken and very um, hydrated. Um, so you could use the barrier film because you can leave that. It, it stings less. Um, not always. Some patients will still tell you it stings, but rather than actually rubbing over the um, broken skin area with the nerve endings exposed, the actual spray um, will just settle and then form a barrier for you. And it dries quicker as well, which is good. So, oh my goodness, guys, I'm sure some of you have seen this. And if it was me, even now, I, where do you start? This is a hugely significant ungradable pressure ulcers, uh, cat three pressure ulcers and um, significant and serious MASD. Um, and it's widespread. And you can see they're catheterized. So where's this fluid coming from? What's happening? Um, where do you start? So we've got look what looks like pressure ulcers and um, IAD or MASD. Um, so what I would do is take a step back and look at it bit by bit. We need a multidisciplinary input at this stage um, because there, there looks like there's a potential infection. Um, so working with our medical teams, um, asking for a blood test, looking for those inflammatory markers that might signify they need systemic antibiotics um, and look out for the pain because it is likely to be very painful. You need to work with your medical teams again to look at what analgesia might be necessary for that person. Um, and again, going to our more serious and severe MASD products, such as our, our pro products, our Mediderma Pro Foam and Spray, again, to cleanse the skin and help break down any fecal matter that's hard to reach um, and get that pH balance back again. Um, in these kind of areas with somebody like contractures as well with patients with um, end stage dementia, we quite often see contractures and it's very hard to get to the um, sort of intimate areas to cleanse. So the foam spray again is quite good to help break down those skin folds that can be difficult to get to. Um, and so it's just a very quick um, way of helping to, uh, to cleanse the skin. So when you see something that you suspect is pressure damage and MASD, separate the two. But when it's significant like this, you're going to need to look at blood tests, um, whether they need antibiotics, whether they need a medical team input. Um, and you need to look at your S-Skin bundle and your severe moisture damage uh, care plan. Bring them together and look at the pain as well. So it is a multidisciplinary approach when it becomes severe. Um, and also whether they might need to um, have such, as I said, in the acute, a bowel management um, system as well. So here's another example of wound exudate that's causing this fluid um, and overhydration um, on the peri wound area. And you can see that, right? I mean, it's very, very wet. It's already getting inflamed. And what we find with these um, unstageable pressure ulcers is we need to remove the non-viable tissue. And when we're doing that through, or till it, um, if we're using dressing, so we're looking for um, the non-viable tissue removed through autelic removal um, or debridement, um, we quite often put hydro dressings on there because you want to hydrate that non-viable tissue for it to lift to encourage healing. But you are adding extra hydration to that area. So as you can see here, you get this peri-wound excess moisture, both from the wound kicking out exudate because the slough is lifting, but also from the dressings itself. So rather than just going, OK, we'll pop on a hydro colloid on that to try and lift the non-viable tissue, just make sure again that we're using the barrier films around the peri wound area so especially where we're using hydro dressings so we've talked about these various wounds and I've talked about this kind of step up and step down so there is this sort of total barrier protection where you've got your mild moderate and severe um, and I'm hoping with some of these pictures that it gives you a better idea of that mild and moderate and severe so mild generally its skin is intact but it is very much at risk and starting to become slightly um erythema for moderate the skin may be breaking down um, and that inflammation is looking a little bit more angry and severe is definitely more extensive um, and from moderate to severe it can be very very painful too so we do need to look at our barrier products guys um, i don't know about any of you but when i trained years ago i remember mentors talking about egg white and oxygen now don't you do that but if any of you are of my age or above, they may be nodding along now. Um, but yes, it was a thing for anybody younger than me. Any of you millennials um, or Gen Zs, 
people think, what on earth is she talking about? But they used to get egg white and brush it on buttocks and then blow dry it with O2, with um, oxygen. Um, which I'm sure works a treat because actually if any of you have got egg white on your hands you wash it off and it comes off beautifully so I'm sure it acted as a great barrier but we don't need to do that now we have products to be able to do that for us um, so look at what barrier products um, are available in your area and make sure they're being used um, whether you put it on your um, medication um, sheets or plans is up to you but I would absolutely recommend it um, if you're a care home residential home it's very CQC friendly especially to make sure that you are documenting your barrier application and then look at depending on what MASD we're looking at what barrier product you need and this is can be difficult um, and so yes absolutely have a look at this smart card so the smart is um, a skin moisture alert reporting tool I've got one here um, we use these at UHP at the hospital and um, because it's just a really good go-to card it's a visual aid for the generalist nurse that have got so much to do on the ward they're so busy um, if they see skin breakdown and they're not quite sure they're able to come up and have a look at their card and just match it like for like um, and say well actually okay we think this is MA let's go for a barrier product and see how that goes so it's a fantastic resource um, and actually of this year it was awarded uh, it was nominated for the nursing times award so off they went to london and celebrated that um, but it's because visual is always good and i think from being a carer in the past myself and a nurse and now a tvn that i mean visual still now is best when it comes to teeth training but also when it comes to looking at wounds we can if we see a wound we understand it a lot more than if someone's just describing it so use your visual tools and um, they're absolutely brilliant um, and I'm really pleased to say that my colleagues um, in 2018 worked on the nappy associated dermatitis um, pathway because we have an awful lot of neonates and pediatrics um, and um, and I learned this from uh, my team and colleagues because I didn't do an awful lot of pediatric care before this but that neonatal skin actually takes a year to fully reach adult skin tensile strength so as a result there's more water loss through transepidermal water loss or TEWL for those that know a bit more about TEWL so this transepidermal water loss um, in children can be higher so you're going to have this increased risk of barrier um, breakdown so we get a lot of inquiries from our midwives from paediatrics and neonatals and as a result UHP put together this NAD nappy associated dermatitis skin um, card as well for the midwives to then go back to because there's still an awful lot of magic potions out there which are still used but not always great for babies bums um, so it's a really good pathway if you are interested and want to see it or implement it in your area of your paediatric. So um, I think I'm bang on time. I hope that that was helpful um, in understanding some of the different clinical presentations between MASD and P and that you have had one or two takeaways from today's session. If you have one or two takeaways, I'm a happy TVN and that you can implement that in some way in your work environment. Um, I would always advise as a TVN, um, if you've got a product already in your area, Give it a go on your own skin if you can get a sample and you're having next time you have a nice long hot bath if you get a chance to have one put your product on one hand and not on the other have a hot bath and see what they look like afterwards and see how effective you think they are um so that's it from me um and i'm going to hand you now back to sam and i'm here for any questions which i hope i can answer um for the next 15 minutes thank you Brilliant. that was brilliant thank you so much Chip. Uh, really really insightful and um it, you know we've had lots and lots of people watching lots of comments and questions come through so uh we'll uh, we'll get straight to the questions i will just say before we start uh that the the smart card that she spoke about at the end there as well uh, you can uh sign up to receive one of those at medicareplus.co.uk slash facebook hyphen live so that link should be in the in the comment section we'll also mention it again at the end of the session but uh thought it was a good time to mention it just before we get stuck in with the questions anyway um so uh, question number one is um should broken skin caused by M masd be left without addressing or covered following application of barrier creams <clears throat> yeah um no thank you it's a really good question um 
still that sort of idea that leaving it open to the air is, is a good thing for social skin loss caused by MSD. But in my experience, patients are very poor. And what we don't want is for that skin to attach to the skin, uh, to the uh, bedding or to the uh, continents pad or their clothing. Um, and actually, when you take that off, you're kind of disrupting that surface skin and they will let know. So because of pain and skin protection, but also protecting the moisture balance of your wound, I would, I would put a dressing on there for sure. Brilliant, thank Thanks. you. Uh, so question two from Debbie is, what is uh, your opinion on wet wipes for skin cleansing? Um, what well, standard wet wipes, if you mean standard wet wipes, like um, like your baby wet wipes, they're quite often they've got perfumes and things in them, so I don't recommend them. Um, I mean, they're great for baby's bums, you know, like a standard baby bum. If you're using them on your baby bum, you're good to go, you're fine. But if we're talking about patients with MASD, um, with other complications, the incontinence wipes are good. So um, you do get continence wipes, so again, they've got that pH answer in there because that's what you're trying to bring back is that acid mantle um, so those continence wipes are absolutely fine but I would steer away from perfume sort of standard baby wipes for your patients. Brilliant thank you uh, so question three is from Kate and Kate asks uh, what do you recommend is used to clean skin with uh, with within susceptible areas? Within sorry susceptible areas? Yes to clean the skin? Uh, yes, that's right, yeah. Um, if they haven't got MASD, um, whatever your, uh, you know, water really and emollients, um, we tend to try to stay away from soap um, because soap can have, again, sort of pH imbalances, it can cause some drying. Again, they've got perfumes in them. Um, for you and me in your shower, you know, use whatever you're comfortable with, but have a look at your patient's skin and how it's responding. Um, but we do try to stay away from soap and tend to use emollients in just water for standard personal care. And again, around those intimate areas, um, you, you know, it's yeah, water, or if it's breaking down, then you might want to look at your foam cleanser if they're incontinent and the skin is breaking down. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so question four is from Lorna, and uh, this one is, what sort of barriers can be used without interfering with absorbency of essential pads? Um, so, well, uh, I don't know if I can name the products that I know are not good, um, but from experience, any zinc-based oxide creams, um, they used to be back in the day, the research, you know, in the 60s and 70s, I hope I'm getting this right. I'm not an absolute expert, but there was some research that zinc oxide was quite good in protecting the skin because it's like it's a nice slick layer. <clears throat> but what we found over the years is actually that's blocking the absorbency of the pads. And so that urine, feces and sweat, instead of being absorbed into your, your prescribed continence pad, is actually sitting on the surface. So we've actually seen some of those zinc type creams cause MASD and so we really try not to to recommend that now um, don't get me wrong certain of the zinc based oxides are great for things like eczema I use it a little bit on eczema on my arms fantastic um, maybe okay for baby's bums although my health visitors and midwives will probably say not um, but certainly not older bums and um, bums that are susceptible to MASD or certainly that are getting MASD so any zinc oxide type creams tend to stop the absorbency into the continence product and that's what causes the problem where your prescribed barrier creams leave a film um, and it's that again they can still have uh, open bowels um, if they're urinary incontinent then at least that's going into the pad and not sitting on that skin so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, question five is from Mark. And uh, Mark asks, like pressure ulcers, are IADs more difficult to identify in darker pigmented skin? Oh, thanks, Mark. Hot topic. I was just talking on this at Milton Keynes two weeks ago. Again, quite close to my heart. Um, yeah, no. So yes and no. I mean, once you get superficial skin loss, um, your melanin, 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 um, thank you, lives in the skin in the stratum corneum epidermis layer. So once you've lost that and you've gone down to deep dermis, um, the pigmentation's lost. So you'll still see that sort of lighter pink um, skin loss, skin tone. So you will see it in brown and black skin. Um, but what you won't see necessarily is erythema. 
So the darker the skin, the harder it is to pick up on erythema. So like we say with pressure ulcers, go on touch and feel. If it's boggy, if the patient's saying it's painful, but also just that sheen effect that you get with moisture. So if they're incontinent um, or if there's excess sweat or they're perspiring a lot and the skin's starting to get that kind of crinkly, shiny effect, suspect mild MASD and treat as such would be my advice but you're absolutely right erythema in any skin condition is harder to pick up in brown and black skin and there's some great tvns doing some great talks on that at the moment if you want to know more on, on that subject or contact me because i've got loads of info as well <laughs> that's brilliant thank you uh, so question uh, six is from michelle uh, do you advise the use of the ph balance cleansers prior to masd or just to treat it yeah, I, I use it really just to treat it. Um, again, it's um, without sounding too crass. If you've got somebody, especially with very sticky, um, like tar feces that you get with uh, patients that take ferrosulfate tablets or end of life, or they've got um, overflow and constipation, so you've got mixed kind of enzymes coming from feces, um, the foam and cleanser, so for your more you know, severe incontinence that's sticking to the skin, rather than rubbing the skin, which you don't want to remove it, the foam and spray kind of dissolves it. Um, without sounding crass, it acts a bit like oven fried would do on your oven that you've not washed for a while and you put it on, it sort of dissolves all the matter for you. Um, it kind of does the same. So it's a lot more comfortable for the patient. Uh, you stop skin rubbing and it helps just remove it in one um, sort of foul sweep as it were. Um, but I wouldn't use it for mild or non-broken skin. Um, usually unless it was as i say very sticky tar feces that's just stuck to the skin but have a go and see what you think you know treat each patient individually for that fantastic thank you uh question seven from allison uh, in relation to peristomal dermatitis do you do you think preventative barrier practices need more focus and more education towards specialist stoma nurses that would be great. Um, I'm still learning about peristomal a lot than I did before because I've come from a long term community into an acute where we've got huge colorectal wards um, and um, absolutely um, it needs more education. I think it's one of those things where stoma nurses and TVNs work quite closely together in these environments, um, but actually stoma nurses in other environments such as community long term care um, may not have this education as well so you know carrying that barrier film with you either in the lollipop form or in a spray um, as a preventative for not just peristomal but things like uh, pegs and trackies um, should be there really to teach informal and formal carers looking after patients in the community as well so yeah I mean we work as closely as we can together as an MDT but a lot, I know what it's like out in the community a lot of you are separate in different places and buildings so yeah absolutely we we could bring that you know to the forefront with our stoma nurses and just even just have a quick team to chat about it yeah definitely thank you uh, so moving on to question eight from Yvonne when you have a combination of moisture and pressure do you treat the pressure first yeah, it's a really good question. Um, both. <laughs> I mean, we always say at the moment you see pressure damage, offload and alert anyway, because you're hopefully stopping the degree of pressure continuing down to the bone. So continue into a cat four. Um, so go if you see both, like we said in that complex patient, just stop and just literally tick off the what you need to do. So with the pressure damage, go through your S skin. Um, with the patient carer or the nurses or your department and look are all of those in place are we giving optimum gold standard care planning for our pressure um, uh, ulcer um, and then look at the MASD what's the cause is there anything preventative we could do is it just a case that we're not using a barrier cream and then have two separate care plans so although MASD will come in to, under S skin because of incontinence MASD does need its own care plan in terms of how you're treating it I hope that makes sense. And you kind of bring them together with your skincare plan. Brilliant, thank you. Um, question nine, what is the first line treatment for MASD now? What is the first line treatment? Treatment, yes. 
um, is to maintain that pH balance really, uh, it's to try and rebuild the, um, the acid's um, skin mantle. Um, it's too alkaline. So, I mean, my treatment for moderate to severe, as I said, would be the foam spray cleanser to cleanse the area, but also um, try and bring that pH balance back to a more acidic um, level and then treat with my barrier products. So it is, it's my go-to, it's our sort of nice guidelines, is our barrier products are our go-to to treat MASD. It just depends on what level you need to treat it on, whether it's mild, moderate or severe. Perfect, thank you. Uh, question 10, uh, what are some of the ways we can manage pain associated with MASD for patients? Yeah, it's, they can be so painful. I've seen patients with PRN, RMOV for MASD and with buromorphine patches, like if it's severe, and then you look at someone with a, a pressure ulcer that's quite deep, that actually the nerve endings aren't repaired or they've gone, that may just be on a lower dose analgesia. So it, we can't base pain relief on depth of tissue injury. Um, it is different for each patient. And as we know, they they don't want to sit on the area. Sometimes they'll feel very sick and nauseated. Um, and we know high dose analgesia can cause lots of other problems, which can exasperate the MASD, such as um, codeines and things that can cause constipation and then increase overflow. So we just don't want to go there, do we? But if you do, um, I can't say this is the pain relief to go to. It does depend on your patient, on the other medications they've got and what they can tolerate. Um, but I would say work with your medical teams. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have access to a pain team, um, work with the pain team as well to try and get that under control for your patients. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so I think we've got time for two more two more questions, if you if you don't mind. So um, thank you, everyone, for all your questions. There's been some really good ones submitted. So a uh, big thank you for those. Uh, question seven, when a fungal infection is present during MASD, how do you manage it? Yeah. Do you yeah? Do you treat the fungal infection first or the MASD first? How do you treat them both? Because if you're putting the barrier on, is the fungal treatment actually getting to where it needs to get to to treat the fungal infection? It's a really good question. Um, and sometimes it's a it's a little bit of playing with it and seeing which goes first. So rule of thumb for me, I will try the fungal treatment first because we need to get that infection under control to decrease the amount of bacteria and pathogens that could enter the stratum corneum and cause a more cutaneous and deeper um, skin infection. So I will treat the um, fungal infection over the fungal site and then apply barrier around the edge of that. Once that's under control, I then go to back to my barrier product to try and prevent that level of exfoliation getting so bad again that the fungal infection starts again. Brilliant, thank you. And uh, on to the last question. So uh, the last question, uh, number 12, is how do you differentiate intertriginous dermatitis from incontinence associated dermatitis? Yeah. I'm glad that was the last question. <laughs> Thanks for that for the last question, whoever that was. <laughs> Tell us we say again. So intertrigo um, tends to be around skin folds. Um, and what was the other one? The IAD, wasn't it? Incontinence yeah. associated yeah so again it's just looking at those two differences so intertrigo will tend to be between skin folds so we see it between um, under breasts um, if you've got a bariatric patient um, making sure that you're looking amongst those skin folds and then treating it with your step up and step down product so if the skin isn't broken and it's quite mild and you want a preventative um, uh, to protect the acid mantle we go to our early stage preventative mild intertrigo MASD if it's incontinence um, we treat it again with a barrier, but it's just recognizing that it's the urinal feces that's causing that skin damage. And I think it's a really good question to end on, because if any of you, like me years ago starting out, that umbrella term was just moisture lesions. And that's probably what you'll hear in practice. Someone will go, they've got a moisture lesion. And you'll be like, they're going, is it IAD? Is it intertrigo? What's the cause? And they'll say, well, it's just a moisture lesion. But actually we're trying to come away from the term moisture lesion um, and, and use the term moisture associated skin damage. Um, and it will take a while, but we'll keep using that and keep banging that drum because that will start in, um, getting the idea into your head that the skin damage is from moisture, but then where is it and uh, what's causing it? So if it's in trigo, we need to look at the protection of the skin folds. If it's incontinence, we need to look at our continence products potentially and our barrier cream for that um, area that is affected by that incontinence. So 
thank you for that question because it does highlight how MASD is an umbrella term although we treat it the same in terms of our barrier cream products for prevention there's lots of different reasons that can cause that MASD. Brilliant uh, thank you Shiv uh, absolutely brilliant session and the uh, the Q&A so many uh, insightful answers there as well so Thank you so much for those. Thank you everyone for submitting those questions. Uh, if we didn't get through to your questions today, then we will try and answer them all in the next few days and we'll post them on our website alongside our, our slides and uh, also the recording of the video as well, if, in case you, you've missed anything. Um, so a big thank you again to everyone for watching, Shiv and uh, Medicare Plus, massive thank you to both of you. Um, big thank you to all of our team and uh, the team at Mull for uh, for running the event as well. Uh, I will just mention the um, the smart card again. So we'll put this link in the comments section. But uh, that website to receive the free smart card is medicareplus.co.uk slash Facebook hyphen live. So that will be in the comments and in the slides as well. Uh, your certificate link should now be on the screen as well. So do download that and uh, that can go in your CPD folder. Uh, as I said, the recording and the slides will be on our website. So do have a look there. Make sure you like our page so that you don't miss any future events. And uh, you can catch up on this at any time as well. So uh, that's all from us. I'll see you for the next one. Thank you very much.